I'm John Lorton, and I've been looking into mysterious occurrences on my YouTube channel since 2015. Joining me today are some friends from Uncovered.com. I'm Rachel Roslett, a forensic psychologist and head of case research and data at Uncovered. I'm Andre Cipriano. I'm also a forensic psychologist, and I'm a case researcher and content creator at Uncovered. Welcome back to Lorton Arts Uncovered. And today, we're looking into the disappearances of two family members two-year-old King Walker and his mentally disabled 21-year-old aunt, Diamond Bynum. In 2015, the two were being looked after by a close family member when, after a quick nap, the caretaker woke up and the pair had vanished. At the center of the investigation are multiple unconfirmed sightings of the pair, and each sighting is in completely different places with very different circumstances. King and Diamond disappeared in Gary, Indiana a city that was once a booming mecca for America's steel industry back in the 1960s. But when local manufacturing jobs vanished and the local economy shifted, the population decreased by 61%. Since then, simply put, Gary, Indiana has become a city where many don't want to raise their children. Within the last 10 years, several schools have closed and it's become a desolate ghost town. According to Neighborhood Scout, a crime rate and statistics database, your chance of being a victim of violent crime in Gary are 1 in 185. That's higher than 95% of U.S. cities. And then there are the abandoned neighborhoods. In 2013, the Gary Department of Redevelopment reported that a whopping one-third of homes within city limits were empty or abandoned. That's more than 13,000 houses. These eerie, abandoned buildings have become another focal point in investigating what happened to King and Diamond. The dilapidated structures have become a strong focus for searchers, and a lack of structural safety has left many of those stones unturned. Let's turn it over to our case experts to learn more. Rachel, Andrea, what can you tell us about King and Diamond, and how does this timeline all come together? So family members both say that Diamond Bynum and King Walker could make anyone smile with their vibrant and unique personalities. First, let's talk a little bit about King Rajan Walker. King was just two years old at the time of their disappearance. Like a typical toddler, his family says that King had a lot of energy and that he loved to run around. His favorite game at the time was to make people chase him, and he'd look back and giggle every time someone got close to him. There are many pictures of him online smiling with his tongue out, showing his fun and energetic personality. Also centered in this case is King's missing aunt, Diamond Daisy Bobby Monet Bynum. Diamond has been described as somebody with a bubbly personality and an infectious smile. Diamond has been diagnosed with prader willi syndrome. It's a genetic condition with both mental and physical implications. So even though Diamond was 21 years old at the time of her disappearance, Diamond has the mental capacity of a five to a seven year old. And her family says it's difficult for her to communicate and converse with others. Her family understands her, however, and she knows her father's phone number. So physically, her condition symptoms manifest in short stature, as Diamond is only four foot and eight inches tall. She also has a pronounced limp, misaligned teeth, and Diamond walks with one arm bent. Her family hopes that by being vulnerable and transparent with Diamond's condition, that it will lead to empathy and an easier time helping somebody remember if they saw her. One other characteristic of Diamond's prader willi syndrome is that it induces constant feelings of hunger, leading those with the condition to overeat. So we mentioned that Diamond is 238 pounds and she's expressed that her favorite food is cheeseburgers, which investigators believe may come into play in understanding the case's timeline. 
Diamond also has medication that she takes daily, and when she doesn't adhere to, adhere to that medication, her behavior may change. Of course, the first thing I'm wondering is if Diamond left with King and then something happened to them along the way. And in an area with a declining population, the chances of them being spotted might be tougher than usual. Obviously, this should be a case where King and Diamond are not just missing, but considered endangered missing because of their ages and their vulnerabilities. So I know we have a handful of key people in this case. Many of them are family members to King and Diamond, and they kind of become part of the case timeline. So just to try to keep it all straight, let's lay out the key people before the timeline so we can try to keep everyone on the same page here. Both King and Diamond are related to Suzanne Bynum. Suzanne is Diamond's stepmother and King's step-grandmother. We also have LaShawn Walker, who is Diamond's biological mother and King's biological grandmother. And both have been dedicated advocates for this case. Ariana and Joshua Walker are King's parents. They've been tirelessly giving media interviews and advocating for their son. Also in the family's corner are Eugene Bynum Jr., Diamond's father, and Daisy Bynum, another biological grandmother to the pair. Okay, got it. And I'm seeing that this family has been described in media as being tight-knit. Yeah, they were. And in fact, Diamond's immediate family actually moved to Gary from Hammond, Indiana in February 2015 so that the whole family could be closer. And, you know, Di Hammond was only about 20 minute drive away. So this really shows the level of dedication that they all had for one another. And with that, though, one of the important parts of this springtime move, the five months before the pair go missing, one thing to note is that because of Diamond's developmental disability, she had pre-existing learning, uh, learning adjustments, you know, with going into this new neighborhood. And so this is really a great segue into the timeline of the events for when King and Diamond go missing because it involves this new neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start in the early morning hours of Saturday, July 25th, 2015. So the day starts with King being dropped off at Diamond's family home in the 500 block of Matthew Street. And King was going to spend the day with Suzanne Bynum, his grandma, and Diamond, while his mother, Ariana, went and attended college classes in Chicago. The day was really meant to be relaxing, um, and but they were gonna spend the bulk of their day um, planning ahead for the next day, Sunday, July 26, which was going to be a celebration for Eugene Bynum Jr.'s birthday. And we know there was nothing else unusual about the routine that they had. So around 10.40 in the morning, Suzanne helps both King and Diamond rest so that they can take an early afternoon nap. And Suzanne also lays down to nap at this time as well. And 40 minutes later, Suzanne wakes up around 11 a.m. and she's surprised, but not immediately alarmed that King and Diamond are not in the house when she wakes up. She's not alarmed because there's no visual sign that something was wrong. You know, there was no busted in door or signs of a struggle like a burglary or a kidnapping. So Suzanne tells investigators that she initially just believed that Diamond had taken King to play out in the backyard or that perhaps the pair had gone for a walk around the block. Um, the family says the two usually took walks um, around the block and that Diamond really enjoyed this activity. And it was something that she did often with her family when they lived in Hammond. But remember, this is still a new neighborhood for Diamond. And because of her cognitive abilities and learning new neighborhoods, she wasn't still fully familiar with the new area. And with that too, it's important to note that Diamond often wanted to take care of King alone, and she believed she was capable. Uh, but the family has shared with the media and investigators that Diamond was never actually unsupervised with King. They were always hanging out in the wings, watching and available at any given notice. So in essence, Diamond had the confidence of solo babysitting, but there was always help there. So assuming when Suzanne wakes up, she immediately checks around the house and then she probably looks out in the backyard first since it's the closest and next logical place to look. 
What does she do when she realizes they're not on the property? So Suzanne says that she then goes out through the front door and she starts to search for Diamond and King up and down the street. Okay. Well, I guess uh, we should probably do that for ourselves. Let's go ahead and take it back to the street view and take a look at this neighborhood. So it's been described as 500 Matthews Street, uh, which is close to a big intersection here with it's called Fifth Avenue, but it almost looks like a highway. It looks like we've got four lanes there. Um, dropping down to Street View, let's just take a look. And I don't know, since they're describing it as 500 Matthew, I don't know which side of that avenue it's on, but kind of on the north side. Uh, and this is a Street View from 2018, keep in mind. So it might look a little different now. First thing that's jumping out to me is there is just a lot of brushiness in this area. Um, and then tie that together with, there might be some issues with some of these homes being abandoned. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's a lot of potential. It would be a difficult search. Like even if mm -hmm. you had hundreds of people, you know, at the ready, um, pretty difficult area to go looking in, but let's go ahead and just take it back to the street view up to the North, continuing on Matthew street. It actually runs into another significant Oh no, a small avenue, but it's got train tracks right on the other side of it. Hmm. So, so the area is really bordered by lots of traffic on one end with a four lane highway and railroad tracks on the other. Yeah. And then beyond that, I think we've got another, uh, let's see. Yeah, we've got the railroad tracks. We've got the 90 in interstate. And then we have a river up here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it looks like an airport. So, I mean, really mm -hmm. heading straight north, there's there's not a lot to get into. South, Matthew Street ends into, I mean, I was concerned about the brush that I just saw on the street, but it ends yeah. right into like a wooded area. So there are lots of places where the two could have found themselves and that would have been uncomfortable or scary or simply places to get lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's the weather like when this is happening? Yeah. So the weather data for that day is that there was a high of 72. And then later that night, it gets to a low of 62. So not horrible. I mean, you know, you think it's we're getting towards the end of summer at this time. And I think one thing that's really interesting for sure is when you go back in time and Google Maps and you could see that August time, you know, we see a lot of neighbors who are outside. And of course, it makes you think, you know, were there anybody, was anybody outside the same day that they were walking around? Because of course, one of the big questions that we have in this case is we simply don't know what their usual walking path was. So we don't even have a baseline to look at where they would have gone. And if there were other people in the neighborhood that would have seen them, and surely they would have known the family by now, you know, we're talking a five month period. So yeah. It would be amazing if somebody had seen something. Yeah, it's also really unfortunate. There's there's businesses, but they're pretty much on Fifth Avenue. Um, we got a little church here, but there's just not much on Matthews, and these neighborhoods are pretty thick all around this. So just opportunities for them being sighted on camera or something very, very lean. Not a lot going on with that. Mm. Okay, so... We know that we have a known trend of Diamond wanting to take care of King, and she likes to also go on walks. So if we kind of combine those things, we also have this story that, but she is always supervised in some way, that there's always someone watching in the wings, essentially. But from Diamond's perspective, she's probably not aware of that. So it could be that that almost you know, gave her this thought that, oh, look, I'm, I'm doing this walk on my own. I'm just going to take King for a walk. Uh, and she wasn't knowing that, you know, the person that's there usually watching after her isn't doing it in that case. And just to take us back into the house. So nothing is determined to be off in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, investigators have ruled out a home invasion or an in-home kidnapping. So it's, it's believed that King and Diamond left the home on their own volition. Um, but once they were outside, that's where the puzzle pieces aren't really easy to find or put together. 
Yeah. And, you know, a lot of these cases where we have a toddler that goes missing in particular, um, I just see a lot of those outcomes where sometimes it's a family member that's involved. The conditions that I'm seeing around this case are just, they're completely different. Uh, There's a lot of interactivity. We got family members kind of coming and going. This is ramping up for a big party that's supposed to happen the next day. Like it just, it doesn't Mm -hmm. seem like it fits the conditions of that. And then really Diamond is kind of an X factor in this because she's missing with him as well. It's just, it's, it's really laying out like a bit of a, a different outcome than I would typically expect with, you know, toddler goes missing from their own home situation. But, and the other thing I might add on that mm-hmm. is in those situations, you often see a delay in reporting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in this case, Suzanne was on it immediately. Yeah. And so I think that also contributes to the perception that it didn't happen there because she's so desperately trying to find them. Yeah. And and what's kind of scary about all that is you have this general lack of evidence. Like there's there's nothing that you can pinpoint right around the home for like, hey, this is going to help us understand what what happened here. Uh, which of course is making this even more difficult to investigate. So please take us back into the case timeline. Uh, where What does Suzanne do after she goes looking on the streets for King and Diamond? Yeah, so after Suzanne looks up and down the street, like we were just talking about, she immediately knows that something is wrong. And she goes home and she calls Diamond's father, Eugene Bynum Jr. And she asks him to come home from work so that they can immediately start looking. Eugene does come home after talking with Suzanne And he begins to drive around the neighborhood looking for Diamond and King. So while he's out doing this, simultaneously, Suzanne is back home calling the police. And this is in the early afternoon. And she immediately reports the pair is missing. Investigators in this case have commended Suzanne for her quick action in taking this seriously, especially in light of um, King's age and Diamond's vulnerabilities. Uh, really every second counts at this point. So the police arrive at the house pretty quickly and immediately start getting to work, trying to piece everything together. They see pictures of Diamond and King and begin to take Suzanne's statement. And that's when she also shares with them about Diamond's physical and mental condition, as well as King's young age. So just to recap, she tells him that King is three feet tall, 34 pounds, and he was wearing a blue t-shirt, red shorts, and white sneakers. He had his hair styled in dreadlocks. Um, We don't really know what Diamond was wearing, but we do know that she is 4'8", and 238 pounds. Police conclude that the two couldn't have walked more than a few miles, and it would have been difficult for Diamond alone to keep King, a toddler, under control. So police start their search by going door to door to each of the streets surrounding the Bynum home, and they take their pictures. The police ask questions about whether or not anyone had seen the pair, and they also ask questions related to the backyard access and property space, considering, like we saw, There's a lot of overgrown foliage patches in the neighborhood and Diamond or King could have easily gotten injured. Yeah. So does any of this information pan out? Unfortunately, not not that we could tell. In our research, we didn't find anything that indicated if the police got any leads from their door to door neighborhood search. But um, there is one potential lead that came up in a few days later, about July 25th, the day the pair disappeared. Employees at a local McDonald's are the first to report a positive sighting of Diamond and King, but the two are seen there before anyone in the community knew that they were missing. So the employees had simply given them food that they ordered and the employees didn't take note of where or when Diamond and King would have left. They were also adamant that Diamond and King were there together and that there wasn't anybody else with them. We found it interesting for a few reasons. We know that cheeseburgers are Diamond's favorite food. So, you know, anecdotally, this piece of information does make sense. It's relatively close by, at least from a driving distance. So it's reasonable to believe that that the Bynum family would have been to this McDonald's in the past and perhaps Diamond would have been familiar with its location. Okay, well, let's go ahead and 
pull up a map on that and uh, looks like I've got it set for walking distance from the Matthew Street address to the McDonald's address. 2.1 miles, uh, four po uh, 43 minutes. They kind of usually estimate three miles per hour, but we're talking with a toddler also. Mm -hmm. so yeah that, i don't i don't know how much time you guys have spent walking with toddlers but yeah their legs are a little a distance sh they're a little shorter and um they they can't quite keep up with that three mile per hour speed i don't think mm -hmm. so if they did walk to mcdonald's i would i would say it's probably more like an hour it could be an hour and 20 minutes or so to get down there um but it I does seem us go ahead andrea I think it's also an attention thing too. I mean, we've learned that King loved to run around. He was a super high energy child and having to take control of someone who was probably super interested by everything on the side of the road, all the businesses, the cars, you know, to keep someone under control for that long of a distance would be difficult for any adult, regardless of what their condition is. Rachel? I also wonder about Diamond's physical condition. When we talked a little bit earlier about her syndrome, we noted that she had a limp. Um, and so I wonder if even she is physically able, that that's a distance. Um, and then to do it with a physical disability with a toddler feels like a really long walk for them. Yeah, yeah, definitely does. Um, one thing that kind of it at least makes it feasible in my mind is the directions for getting there are so simple. It's literally yes. one turn. And if Diamond kind of knew, hey, whenever we leave in the car, we always turn right here and then McDonald's just shows up like that would be enough, mm -hmm. I think, in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, giving her the ability to actually get get down here. But um, do we know was any surveillance footage found of them visiting here nothing was reported hmm i would i think it's pretty weird i mean i can see there's a camera at least here on the drive through already but i would mm. think most mcdonald's have some type of camera system in there uh if nothing yeah. else just to verify that oh yeah you know we we have footage <laughs> of them they definitely did show up um but here i'm seeing the same thing like you know structures that you think businesses might be in there's there might be a business in there. I'm not really seeing anything for cameras outside of that. And then we've just got so many home structures around this, um, on this stretch. Well, and for reasons we'll talk about in just a minute, I mean, I'm not surprised that no footage was available to, to look at later because I don't know that the community realized there was a reason to retain the footage sure. or to look at it. Sure, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, what happens with this lead? You know, honestly, not not a lot happens. And this is really just another single puzzle piece in this larger puzzle that's really unfinished. And, you know, in this whole investigation, I think it's important to note at this point here that an Amber Alert was not issued at any point in the investigation. So without the alert, the only people who knew about King and Diamond disappearing only knew about it because of the flyers and that the family put up and there was only a few local news segments. So if you didn't watch the news and you didn't see the flyers, you wouldn't know to look for Diamond or King. There wasn't an Amber Alert issued for a two-year-old missing toddler and an intellectually disabled aunt missing together and they couldn't get an Amber Alert on it? Like that's, nope. that's kind of what the system's for. Like I'm pretty shocked. And, you know, I, I think none of us are surprised to hear that the family fought for one to be issued from the beginning. Um, but for whatever reason, the local police never issued anything during the most critical time of their investigation. And it took nearly two months before they were even able to get a silver alert issued for diamond um, and just to remind everyone a silver alert is only sent out to residents when someone is believed to be suffering from alzheimer's dementia or some other mental disability and they're uncounted for and surprisingly when we researched researched this we couldn't find that king was even mentioned in the alert so we have 
only one alert that goes out two months later, only for Diamond and none for King. It's weird because I think the majority of Amber Alerts, Amber Alerts that I see locally are typically for a child being taken by another parent or by a family member. Like that's mm -hmm. that's kind of the most common one that I see out here in particular. And I'm not, I don't, I don't think that Diamond has done anything nefarious at all, but it's yeah. a similar condition. Like, you know, toddler going missing with family member. Like mm. I, I do know from looking into it at several different states, they have different rules state by state. Uh, I don't know in particular for Gary, Indiana, some of the states say that you have to have like a license plate information or a vehicle description, something like that. Obviously, in this case, we don't have anything like that. So I'm wondering if there was one of those kind of hard conditions that they're just kind of like, this just doesn't fit what we use Amber Alerts for. But even outside of that, the silver alert should have applied immediately. And mm -hmm. if you're going mm -hmm. to do an alert like that, why aren't you going to include information about King with it? Like if you see this missing woman and you're like, oh, but she you know, has a kid with her. They didn't mention a kid. Like it, it just, it seems like that would be important information for sightings. So I'm just, yeah, I'm really shocked. So what we have here is, is a very real possibility that there was other people that could have seen Diamond and King, but they had no idea that there was anyone to look for. So we've probably got a bunch of stories out there that just haven't hit the tip line because of this. That's, it's mind blowing. Right. You know, and that's why this work is so important with any case to get media attention because spreading information is the only way that people are going to know if they've ever even seen something. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously I, I couldn't even agree more. Um, so do investigators have any other evidence to lean on in this case? Yes. Um, there was new information, but it, it, perhaps conflicts or complicates the McDonald sighting. So four days after King and Diamond go missing, um, which would have been Wednesday, July 29th, 2015, investigators started a large scale search of the nearby abandoned homes with local volunteers who had heard about their disappearance through flyers and word of mouth. The police um, use canine units and they get hits right away. But the dogs take the police south and towards the forest at the end of the road. Okay. Okay. So the canine dogs track both Diamond and King sent to local train tracks, but the dogs lose the trail at the railroad crossing. And another group of dogs were able to follow the scent down a different street that ends up near a local gas station. So ultimately, the dogs didn't find anything else. And the state of many of the abandoned homes made it so that the searching was just too dangerous and they just couldn't keep continuing. So and the, the official well, the dogs yeah. actually take them to the train tracks. So assuming that they did walk down Matthew Street, we're now assuming that they cleared through this big kind of dense area and then got out to the train tracks on the south side. I think there is also a way that you can get to those tracks through. Yeah, like this, they would have to go all the way around the yeah. forest, which yeah. is probably less likely. OK, mm -hmm. gotcha. Hmm. But yeah, it seems I mean, pretty daunting. Yeah, absolutely. So do they continue the searches here? What happens with the searches? Ultimately, they, they have to call all of the searching off because by early August, there's a lack of resources and they they simply just deem everything too dangerous to keep looking. It just it seems like such a strong thing. I mean, you have, you know, scent dogs bringing you down to this area. Um, hmm. Have you guys heard about any volunteer efforts on the family's part? Volunteer searches? We know that the family did help in terms of like any time that there was a an actual search that was orchestrated. They were a part of it for sure. Yeah. I would imagine that they would have kept continuing regardless of the official searches. But ultimately, you know, what I think is so interesting, and the family has talked about this in the media too, that the dogs take them in the direction that's away from the McDonald's. So if we try to say that both of those locations are true and that the McDonald's yeah. sighting really did happen, You'd have to imagine that Diamond and King 
would have gone south, gone through the forest, went towards the train tracks, the gas station, and then looped back up and around to go to the McDonald's. And the family has said that they don't know how plausible that is. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's very plausible. I think the best approach with that is to kind of, you know, try to address both areas, like something around a McDonald's, I would say, nail that with flyers. And then something like this, where you've got, you know, heavily wooded area, I would say, try to get volunteer searchers. But the other big X factor that we have in this story is we've got all these empty houses. Like, what if what if she did know enough how to get them back down to the McDonald's, but then on the way home, she got the turn wrong. And then, I mean, there is a possibility she could have got back to Matthews and then got the turn wrong and wound up down here. Like, I, I wouldn't absolutely discount it, but, um, you know, having the scent dogs hit so strong in this area, me personally, like, I just wouldn't be able to let it go. I'd, I'd be out there every weekend at a minimum, you know, mm -hmm. just trying mm -hmm. to see what I could find out there. Right. Uh, I mean, um, how many how many cases of missing people where like the family would do anything for canine units to help? Yeah. And to have, like you said, to have any sort of positive indication, at least in a direction, take that and run. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Any other notable leads with this? Well, in the days and the weeks that followed their disappearances, there have been some witnesses that have come forward and said that they saw the pair. Some say they saw them at a bus stop, while others say they saw them at a nearby White Castle and Checkers restaurant. Uh, to that end, the restaurant witnesses claim that the pair was with an unidentified woman. No more information has been provided about these unconfirmed sightings, though, so we don't really know which restaurant she was reportedly seen at or any other information about these uh, reported sightings. Wow. And of course, no video surveillance to back up any any of this stuff. Where does the case stand mm -hmm. today? So today, Diamond and King's disappearances remain unsolved. And following the one year anniversary of the case, investigators launched a task force with renewed energy, but nothing noteworthy is shared with the public regarding any new leads. Mm -hmm. They, uh, regarding their in investigations, detectives began to look at local sex offenders as they usually do and identified someone of interest, but only about two weeks after doing that, they released another statement that said the sex offender was no longer of interest in the case. And one of the more prevalent theories is that Diamond and King, like we were just talking about, that they had gotten lost and took shelter in an abandoned home waiting to be found and only unfortunately to perish due to the environment or of course these unstable and unsafe shelter conditions. So others theorize that someone nefarious would have also preyed upon the two of them. One of the last theories that we saw uh, swirling around the internet uh, surrounds the belief that Diamond and King are somehow involved with that unidentified woman that was supposedly seen with one of them at the fast food restaurants. Some believe that, you know, she was just being helpful and made sure that they were fed and then let them go on their way while others theorize that she took them and started a new life somewhere else. Hmm. Man, I don't know. I don't know about some of these theories. I mean, we have three possible sightings at food locations, no video to back up any of it. One possible sighting at a bus stop, two possible walking routes uncovered by canine units. Uh, ladies, where are you with this case? Where, where do you think this stands right now? Let's start with Andrea. Yeah. You know, I was sharing earlier today that this was the this is the second case that I ever researched for Uncovered. And part of where I get so stuck with it is exactly like what you just said, John, that there are so many different rabbit holes and different avenues that theories have have taken hold with this case. So I think there's a there's something really to be said about the fact that the only thing that we have in a lot of these sightings is just eyewitness accounts. Mm -hmm. And it could be one of those those things where when you learn about a missing person or maybe a missing pair of people in your in your neighborhood and you see someone or a group of people that you think look like them and then suddenly everything is evidence where people are calling in sightings you know the bus stop the restaurants i think the one sighting with this unidentified woman is 
I think it's just, it's really difficult to make it make sense, especially to think that, oh, she was someone nefarious and then took them. It just seems very, you know, straight out of a movie. And I, I think it is more likely that they went on their walk, they got lost and something else happened that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that leaves two pretty distinct possibilities, you know, some type of accidental demise something along those lines or potential still for a crime of opportunity someone that comes along the two of them and decides this is a possible abduction scenario or, or something like that so it's it's a big it's a big fork at the end of that road uh rachel what do you think um I, I, similar to andrea uh i i do think the eyewitness sightings are problematic. It's so important that people come forward with these tips. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also really important that uh, because what we know through research on eyewitness testimony, that, you know, they can be unreliable. And we don't have anything here that seemingly backs up any of those eyewitnesses testimony. So, you know, I don't know that we can do much for that, but the, I, I find um, the canines picking up the scent and where they went to be perhaps the most promising or interesting one um, to pursue. I think, yeah, they they went off alone and you've you've got a toddler that will get tired and maybe needed a break or they got lost um, and something bad happened from there. Yeah. Yeah. And there, I mean, just the area, there's, there's so many challenges with making the discovery in this area. You know, uh, if, if mm -hmm. they had gone missing on a hiking trail or something like that, the probability of them being found, I think would be stronger because you have people that are going to go through that trail later. There's going to be bicyclists, runners, all these different things that happen out there. Here, we've got an area that is already not doing great. Uh, we've got a third of the houses there being empty. And then we've got this kind of dense foliage that's popping up all over the place. Like this is just an extremely tough search on that level. Um, but if does someone have if, the information out there? That's really, that's really the big thing here. Does someone, one of those sightings that are kind of, you're right, they could be hard to trust. And I think people are coming from the right place in absolutely. wanting, you know, wanting to be helpful. Um, but I think one of those sightings is probably our best bet in a case like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uncovered, and I know you, John, talk about collective impact and how we can help as individuals on these cases. This seems like this would be prime opportunity for the community to come together with law enforcement to perform organized and safe searches to canvas all of these areas and really do grid searches to say, okay, they're not here and, and cross this off the list. Um, it just seems like there's there, it feels like this is one time we could really actually do something to help this family. Yeah. 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 And, and there's gotta be, I mean, I know we're talking about an, an area where, you know, finances are challenging, um, population yes. is dwindling. So even finding volunteers is going to be a bit of a tricky proposition. But I'll tell you, there's one thing I know that's out there, churches. Mm -hmm. Tap mm -hmm. into your local churches and there's groups of people there, usually people that care about others and are willing to help and things like that. So I think there's still a good opportunity for, for volunteer efforts in, in a case like this. Andrea, Absolutely. what were you going to say? Yeah. And, you know, when we were talking earlier about just Gary, Indiana, and a lot of the, the situation where so many parts of the community are, are abandoned, even just doing a quick Google search or even a YouTube search of Gary, Indiana, it's become such a hot spot for people who are doing like urban exploring. And, you know, clearly that's, it's for a different purpose, right? It's for filming videos. It's for going into these houses and, and that type of thing. But clearly there's there's some element of of want, you know, people wanting to explore these areas. So if there are people who are experts in this type of thing of how to be safe in unsafe structures, that type of help would be so valuable for this community, especially with the abandoned home searches, because we don't even know, like plotting where the searches were because this was a tight knit community 
an organization wasn't necessarily at the the forefront of doing some of these searches, we don't really know what areas were searched and were not searched. So even starting from that standpoint of where do we go from here, that would be super helpful in opening this case up. So uh, Rachel, do you want to tell us about that? Is Uncovered trying to do something in terms of information about the searches? Specifically, we'd love to hear from anyone who might have personal experience with the searchers to help plot the map of abandoned neighborhoods or homes that have or have not been searched. Nice. So for more information, you can definitely dive in for yourself at Uncovered.com's page for this case. The address is on the screen and we have a link in the description box below. And there you can see all of our sources and the full timeline of King and Diamond's disappearance. King, Walker, and Diamond Bynum's case is one that clearly needs more exposure. The current police commander, Jack Hamity, recently spoke about this case and said, if we can get a good lead towards any avenue, it could be anywhere in the country, we welcome any of those leads. Once again, for good measure, King was three feet tall, 34 pounds, and was wearing a blue t-shirt, red shorts, and white sneakers. His hair was styled in dreadlocks. King would be nine years old now, and we've been running an age progression picture right below me on the screen here, that one done by Nick Mech. It's unclear what Diamond was wearing when she went missing, but we know that she was four feet, eight inches tall and 238 pounds. Today, Diamond would be 28 years old. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of both Diamond Bynum or King Walker, please contact the Gary, Indiana Police Department at 219-881-1214, or you can also email them info at gary.gov. Thank you to the Walker and Bynum families, The Charlie Project, Chicago Sun-Times, CBS2, Indiana Missing Report, ABC7, WLS-TV, WGN 720 Radio, Yahoo News, WTTW, Chicago PBS, Daily Mail, People, Casey Hudson, The Overlooked Podcast, The Never Found, Never Forgotten Podcast, Reddit Web Sleuths, and Wikipedia. Before we end today's episode, we want to let you know about Uncovered launching a new feature where you can help them pull together information on a case. Rachel, you want to tell us more about that? Sure. So we could not do this without the help of our community and people like you. And so we recently launched a new feature to make it easier for people to share information for us. So we need your help. And the great thing that we try to do with this feature is make it easy for people to send us information. Um, you can do it while you're watching TV. Um, but if you navigate to our site and uh, John has a case uh, pulled up here from Minnesota, Kenneth Klein, you scroll down below the picture and you'll see that we've added this yellow box that says contribute to the case. So if you would happen to know something about this victim, you would click on that button. And the first thing it's going to ask you for is the URL or the web address for the source that you found. So think news articles, a podcast, something on NamUs, anything like that. Um, and you put that URL in there and click next. And after that, you can tell us, you know, if there's a photo in there, if there are physical descriptors, timeline information, all of that. And then it gets entered into our database. We review the information, decide if it's appropriate to put up, and, and then we do. Um, one of the things that people have been spending a lot of time doing for us is, is photos. Um, these are quick, easy searches. You could probably do them in five or 10 minutes, find the photo, put in that URL and send it to us. Um, but again, we can't do this without you. So if you have a few minutes, even while you're listening to this, this uh, show, click over to the website, find a case in your area and send us some information so that we can um, create this digital footprint for these victims and help make a difference for these families. Uh, become part of one of the best teams in terms of pulling this case information together. It's, uh, it's now in your hands. Thank you guys so much. As always, a big thank you to my friends at Uncovered.com and co-hosts on today's show, Rachel Rosalette and Andrea Cipriano. Please join us again in two weeks as we look into another mystery that deserves to be uncovered. <laughs>